I'm Bill Castle, and this is Free Expression. This program is all about conveying the Christian message from a Catholic point of view and defending the liberty which makes it possible to do that. We talk with creative, interesting people about education today, how parents can get information about their kids' schools, training for direct political action, and finding safe books. Join us. Sit back and enjoy some free expression. kid, probably the most pressing question parents had for their children's schools was what time does the bus pick them up? Not so nowadays. Today, parents face all kinds of great unknowns about what their children will learn. Everything from what will they be taught about the founding fathers and the Constitution to will my kid be encouraged to change sex? Public education has become a minefield into which young people walk. Mom and Dad need help, they need reassurance, and they can't count on teachers, on administrators, or on school boards to provide it. An organization called Protect Our Kids is trying to fill that knowledge gap for fearful parents faced with sending little Dick and Jane off to the neighborhood school. Mark Schneider, president and founder of Protect Our Kids, is here to tell us about how to extract that crucial school information from local educational officials. Mark, thanks for being with us. Bill, I'm just delighted to be with you today. What are the basic concerns that parents have about schools these days? It's what we at Protect Our Kids have called, um, just to simplify the narrative, the triple threat. There are basically three components that have infected the nation's public schools. Some states are worse than others, but this is all over the country. And those three components are sex and gender theory, the idea that uh, your biology, it really doesn't matter. You can be uh, any gender that, that you want to be. It's completely subjective. And along with that, the ideology says that children are sexual from birth, and they should be encouraged in this aspect of their lives beginning in elementary school. Mm-hmm. The second component is critical race theory. So this is the idea that a race is a social construct put together by the elites to both exploit and oppress people of color. And then finally, the third component is what is called social and emotional learning. It's a form of replacement parenting where the government operating through the public school system assumes the role of parent to teach a warped version of values, ethics, decision-making, and self-management. There's a lot of detail behind each one of these components, but when you put them all together, the underlying worldview is critical theory, and parents should be extremely concerned about it. I understand that we now have a couple of generations of teachers who have been steeped in this ideology, but what what really is driving this? What's the worldview that has taken hold so firmly in the educational community? Well, that's a great question. Now, many would argue that critical theory stems from what is called the Frankfurt School. And these were a group of uh, academics and trained Marxists that lived in Germany. They all came from Germany. There was one Italian in the group in the Weimar Republic of Germany. So this was all happening as Hitler was just starting to come to power in Germany. Men like Theodor Adorno, Max Horkheimer, Herbert Marcuse, and the Italian Antonio Gramsci. And they believed that if communism or Marxism were ever going to take root in Western civilization, it would not happen through what they call a war of movement, meaning an actual physical war. The West was just too strong for that. It would have to occur by what they call a war of position, which means that they would have to take over Western society's most important institutions, the culture, the media, commerce, government, 
starting with primary and secondary education. The goal being to replace Judeo-Christian worldview with a form of Marxism. So these all fall under the rubric of critical theory. When Hitler came to power, they were in trouble there in Germany. They were, they were not fascists. They were communist. But they found an ally in a man who is known as the father of progressive education in America, a man named John Dewey. And he actually invited all of these folks to take up residence at Columbia University, specifically at the Teachers College. And this happened in the, uh, starting in the late 1930s and on through the 1950s. And from there, they spread to all our higher academic institutions. And in time, it started to weave its way into our nation's public schools. We know that teaching quality and the educational resources can vary from district to district, but can we assume that this is pretty much across the whole country, that all or most school districts are infected with these ideas? Well, you know, just as all politics is local, all education is local as well. But for parents to be on the safe side, I think they need to be on guard. Now, there are pockets, you know, particularly in rural America and middle America, the bastions of conservatism, where, you know, I think there are still some good examples of of public schools that are trying to do the right thing, certainly in states like Florida, with a governor like Ron DeSantis, who is affirmatively working to root out critical theory in the public schools. Those are good examples, but I think the assumption has to be for parents to always be on guard and do their diligence because this is this is truly swept across the nation, starting on the coasts and working inward. Now, the first thought that comes to mind of, of most parents, I would imagine, as well, if I if if my kids are going to face this in public school, I should find a private school or parochial school. Is there any guarantee that these ideas are not going to be present in those kinds of institutions? Well, there's no guarantee, but, you know, the the public school, uh, this is a government monopoly, and that's the worst kind of monopoly there is. And and parents, unless they're actively on the school board and able to influence, you know, state educational law, they, they have a much better chance of influencing the curriculum in a private school than they do the public school. And we actually encourage parents, if they have the financial ability, even if it's a financial stretch, to make the sacrifice and remove your children from the public school for a Judeo-Christian-based private school, or better yet, homeschooling. It's actually more doable than most parents realize. Now, you provide a number of resources for parents. What what kinds of materials do you have available? On our website, which is protectourkidsnow.org, we not only provide a lot of information about the threats, which I've just given an overview of, but we also provide what we call toolkits, and we have them for parents, pastors, teachers. Uh, we have a medical research page that talks about the gender ideology from a medical standpoint. If you look at these tools, you can download brochures, uh, or you can certainly read them online to, to read yourself or give to your friends and neighbors to become more educated about this. You can learn about your legal rights in the public schools as a parent the rights that your children have not to be indoctrinated into these ideologies. So we we have a host of materials available on our website. A lot of parents have become aware of these problems and complained to their school boards only to find themselves rejected, sometimes physically tossed out, even arrested. What can parents do if if they really are up against it and are, you know, they raise legitimate questions and just find out that nobody's listening? Well, unfortunately, I mean, we have reached that state um, here in the United States. You know, I live in California, and uh, California is the worst of the worst. (laughs) Academically, we were, you know, at the bottom rungs compared to the other 50 states, and yet California is on the vanguard of pushing these kinds of uh, orthodoxies in the public schools. So I'm very versant in, uh, you know, state orthodoxy and, and oppression. Parents, they just need to show courage. They need to go to school boards. They need to assert their authority. Parents do have constitutional rights. 
And these go back to the 1920s. Uh, cases our Supreme Court has decided they've not been overturned. For example, to control the upbringing of their children, to make important decisions when it comes to their values, to participate in their local government. They have a right to inspect curriculum materials in the public schools. They have a right to meet with school officials. They have a right to be notified of bad curriculums that are being offered their children and to opt out of these curriculums. These are both state and federal rights that uh, parents have. And so we would recommend that they take advantage of all of these things. But again, you know, the, the best thing to do if you can is to remove your child from the public schools. Well, once again, where can they find out about the work you're doing and the materials that you have available? Our website is protectourkidsnow.org, and uh, you can go there, and all of this material is available. One of my colleagues, uh, Pastor George Roska, Jr., he and I do a radio program together, and you can find it on Spotify, Apple. Look for Protect Our Kids. It's called Say What? And every week we take on an important issue and talk about it in detail. That's a half-hour segment. And that is available also uh, directly from our website. Yeah, that's great. I'm sure you have some fascinating programs that people would want to know about. Mark Schneider, president and founder of Protect Our Kids. Um, (laughs) Some strange things are happening in the world of education these days, and uh, your message will resonate with a lot of folks, I'm sure. Well, I certainly hope so. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I don't think there are many issues more important today. If you're a parent of a school-aged child, than the indoctrination that's occurring in the public school system. complain about poor educational quality or the morally questionable things their kids are being taught in class, a common response is, if you're so upset, you should run for school board. Well, that's certainly in the great American tradition of citizen participation, but it's not as easy as it might seem. If you've never been involved in politics, where do you even start? Well, FreedomWorks has an answer. That well-known activist group has established a special program to train aspiring school board candidates. It's called BEST, Building Education for Students Together. Laura Zork, director of BEST, is here to tell us about it. Laura, thanks for being with us. Well, thank you for having me on. There's certainly a lot going on in schools to upset parents these days, especially parents who are grounded in faith or struggling to raise children in a morally balanced way. But is getting involved in politics really a viable option for the average citizen? Well, I don't think we have any other option at this point. I know myself as a parent, I have four children, and I was just fed up with the way that our school district was ignoring the voice of the parent, and they just kept doing what they wanted to do. And myself as a parent, I never thought I would ever run for a political office. I actually ran for school board, served for four years, and I know from experience, if you want to make change on your local level, you need to run for school board. And the problem is that we have teachers' unions, we have retired teachers, retired administrators, but one voice that we are lacking on the school board is the voice of the parents, and I think that was very prevalent during COVID whenever we saw some of the decisions that were coming down the pipeline. As it happens, I've had a glimpse into this situation. A family member ran for school board unsuccessfully, I should point out. But I I know that he got into all kinds of unexpected complications. He had to address the teachers' union. He was confronted by an adversary who was much more experienced. He had limited resources. How, How do you prepare somebody to face all of these challenges? Well, I am going to tell you the good news about these questions that you were asking me. The filing deadline for school board members in Michigan is on August 12th of 2024. The election's on November 5th. Our training, what we 
through our best training, we prepare individuals because there are steps that you need to take before you even file to become a candidate. So we walk them through about how to get engaged with your local community, how to identify what those areas of concern are with the local constituent base. And we start helping them build a campaign even before they file. We help them with their networking. We show them areas of opportunity for fundraising. But there is a lot of work that goes into preparing before you even file and become a candidate. So that is something that a lot of newbies thinking, well, I just file, I get a a few signs, I go to a couple of forums, and then I run my campaign that way. But the teachers' unions and everyone else knows that there's a lot of planning that goes into really becoming a good candidate. So we, as experience, because this training that we offer is from individuals that had actually ran for school board, some lost someone, but we learn from our mistakes, right? And uh, we carry those trainings into the local communities because we feel that there is hardly any training out there for parents on learning how to run for school boards. So this is a really a unique opportunity. You know, with the school board candidate training, it's really a passion of mine just from being a mom Being on the school board, I know how important it is for parents to get elected to these positions. So these trainings are free, and they're six weeks, very fundamental basics. And then once they get through these six weeks, we walk with them while they're running for school board, and we help give them strategies and specific tactics to overcome the opposition that they're going to have with these other groups. How is it conducted physically? Do people have to go to a particular location? Is it online? How does it work? We have two ways that we are offering our School Board Candidate Academy. We do offer them online, so we do have one coming up starting on November 9th because we wanted to wait to get through the 2023 cohort of candidates that we have out there. So we are having a new School Board Candidate Academy starting on Zoom on November 9th, so if anyone wants to go to Parents Know Best, Dot com. That's parentsknowbest.com. Under um, events, they can sign up for our School Board Candidate Academy, and they can join us that way. But another way that we are starting to plan out right now for the springtime is that we are actually going to be coming into local communities within um, Michigan and offer these trainings in person, too, because there's a lot of great training that we can do online, but when we start working with candidates on forum prep and debate prep, a lot of that needs to take place in person. What's your take on people's attitudes? There have been so many questions raised about electoral integrity. People often sense that the cards are stacked against an outsider actually really having a chance at accomplishing this. You talk with people all the time. Have we reached a point where people are pessimistic? Is there still hope for this aspect of the democratic process? Well, I tell you what, I I wouldn't be able to get up every morning and work four days a week away from my family if I thought we did not have a chance. We are seeing in our districts, these parents are stepping up, they're running for school board, single parents, parents at work, they're running for school board and they are winning their election. Uh, Last November, when we first started our, our school board candidate academy back in 2022, we had over 101 parents across the nation, that was our first cohort, that actually won their election. We learned a lot from that cohort. We learned that there are certain things that we want to continue doing and certain things that we shouldn't be doing. But I'm going to tell you, we can't allow that negative message to prevent us from actually taking back our school boards. And the way that we do that is we get parents elected one one seat at a time, and we we cannot give to the neg- negative thoughts that, what does it matter? I, you know, I, I'm not going to win. I'm The decks are stacked against me because what we're seeing from our, our point of view, parents are winning these elections. 
What we have learned is that when, if we know we're going into a blue area, we have learned how to message toward not losing our principles, but also being able to win over those those blue votes. There's really three areas that across the board that individuals, it doesn't matter what party they're associated with, most of everyone is concerned about the academic success of students, transparency, how their money is being spent. There is a large number, it doesn't matter what party, they, they're still concerned about protecting their parental rights. So that is how we're, we're starting to shape the platform issues and the platform for these individuals that are definitely in these more left-leaning areas. Well, that's an important word of hope. Uh, I really appreciate it, especially since I am in Michigan and the political situation here is pretty grim in many ways. I, I appreciate your, the optimism you're bringing to this. Once again, where can people go to find out more about your program and maybe even sign up? They can go to parentsknowbest.com. And to sign up for our school board trainings, they can go under events or they can also go under resources. And they can take a look at our school board candidate toolkit that we have that outlines what our trainings look like. Laura Zork, director of the BEST program, a school board candidate training offered by FreedomWorks. Thanks very much for being with us. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me on. And on the topic of education, here's a discussion I had a few months ago about books for kids. One of the fiercest battlegrounds in our current culture wars is, oddly enough, children's literature. Mainstream publishers seem to be in some kind of wild competition to turn out books that make children question everything that they've been told is right and true. But there are people who are attempting to take a different path and provide kids with uplifting and encouraging material to read. One of those is a company called Brave Books, and I'm speaking with the CEO of that organization, Trent Talbot. Trent, thanks very much for being with us. Thanks for having me on, Bill. What is this all about? How did the company get started? Uh, what sort of material are you publishing? What Brave Books is a pro-God, pro-America, anti-woke children's book publisher. We think that there is a real war going on for the hearts, minds, and souls of our children. That the that right now culture culture is winning over parents. We we think that there's more children of culture today than there are children of of their parents, and that the fabric of America is at risk, and that the best way to hold on to what makes America great is to help facilitate the transmission of values from one generation to the next. And when you look at the landscape of children's entertainment, children's literature, it's so one sided. Where you know ninety five percent of it is more the woke content. And so we we think that there needs to be books out there that help reinforce the values that Christian and conservative parents hold dear, and that's actively pushing back against this leftist agenda. You tackle some pretty hard-edged topics. You, you deal with gender, you deal with pro-life issues, you deal with the capitalist system, cancel culture, critical race theory. This is pretty heavy stuff for kids. Yeah, well, they're hearing about, about these topics one way or the other. And so the question is, do we, as parents, do we just sort of passively sit by and let them more or less get indoctrinated? Or do we educate them what, what we believe so that whenever they hear these things, they're able to discern what's, what's right versus wrong, what's true versus false? Because, unfortunately, it's so pervasive out there that sheltering our kids and you know, having them not hear about things like the transgender movement, that's not really an option at this point. So we've got to talk to our kids. We've got to educate them. Are you aiming specifically at the market of individual sales, that is to say, trying to get the books directly into the hands of the parents, or do you try to penetrate the educational market? Is there a, you know, kind of a multi-pronged effort here? How do you operate? Primarily, we're direct to consumer. Braybooks.com is the website, and, and people go. We've got a book of the month club in which people subscribe, and they get a new book every single month. 
every month. The book teaches a new lesson that you know is pro America, anti woke, and so so some of things like um, you, you mentioned a few of them. Um, but then we we also have just sort of honest you know American values like hard work. Um, we cover like First Amendment, Second Amendment. But what what makes us unique is that we're not preachy. Like we are the opposite of preachy. Our stories are just fun. There and we've we've built our a whole universe with the cast of characters that kids just fall in love with. And the stories, first and foremost, they're just great entertainment, and the, and the kids love them. And, and but but in inside of these stories, we are communicating a truth with with them. But oftentimes, if you just read the story, I mean, for, especially for the younger kids, it would it would sort of go over their head. But what makes our product unique is that we put a lot of thought into how we design the books and and. After the story, we have something called the Brave Challenge, in which the games and discussion questions for the whole family to get involved in. And what the Brave Challenge does is it creates a conversation between the parents and the kids and, and sort of sets the parents up to teach their kids about whatever topic the book's on. And I think that's so important. You know, rather than just the books communicating a lesson and talking straight to the kids, having it come from the parents is a huge deal for us. We want to help make parents the resource that children look to whenever they have questions for how the world works or what's right versus wrong. We want to put parents back in the in the driver's seat there. Well, the books really look great. I mean, the, the graphics are very clever. You've gotten very endearing characters that, that you've been created and, and run through these books. And I see that you also have some pretty uh, pretty high-profile people writing for you. I had Dinesh D'Souza and his wife, Debbie, are, are among your stable of authors. Yeah, we've been super blessed that the conservative movement's been able to get behind us like they have. And, yeah, they really believe in what we're doing. And so they've been willing to partner with us and, and co-author books with us. And it's just been a real blessing to help us get the word out. Well, where can people find out more information about this and learn how to sign up for your book club and all the rest? Bravebooks.com. That's the place to go. And it's a great gift for grandkids or if you're a mom or dad. I mean, it's, it's an awesome, awesome thing for, for kids. We get emails or messages on social media every single day talking about how favorite day of the month is when their Brave Book comes in. And they just absolutely love, love the story that we're telling. So. Bravebooks.com. Trent Talbot, hey, thank you very much for taking a couple of minutes and talking about this. Uh, you, you got an interesting line started here. I hope it grows and uh, becomes wildly successful. Oh, thank you so much, Bill. I appreciate that. Be with us next time when we explore other aspects of religious communication and look deeper into the great Christian heritage of free expression. Free Expression with Bill Castle is a production of Good Shepherd Catholic Radio and Company Publications, where good books, good music, and good radio are always good company. Dan Curris provided technical assistance. Theme and incidental music are by Dan Adam. The program was produced and directed by Bill Castle. This is Good Shepherd Catholic Radio.